it's not that we pretend those things never happened or that they never existed. It's that we bring them in to the relationship with the Lord so he can heal the place of pain and turn it into a place of strength. Every loss is supposed to be a place of vengeance. Not your vengeance, not mine, but where God shows himself strong. Why build a life formed around the disappointment of loss when you could use it for the place of promotion for breakthrough? Today, I want you to go, if you would, to Mark chapter eight. And, uh, and I wanna to talk to you out of this chapter. This uh, is one of the most important chapters, honestly, in my life. Uh, that's uh, in no way an exaggeration. I had an unusual experience, probably going back 20 years. It seemed that every time I opened my Bible, it just opened to Mark eight. I could be wanting to go to the Psalms and it would open to Mark eight. I'd wanna to go to you know, the book of Jude and it would open to, to Mark chapter eight. And it doesn't do that anymore. So it's not a crease in the Bible. It's not a broken spine. It just would open to Mark 8 over and over and over again. And after probably a half a dozen times, I thought, this is weird. Maybe I should read it. And so I did. I I tend to be real systematic in my reading. I'll read like the Old Testament or New Testament or Gospels or Book of Law. And I, I take sections, maybe the epistles, the minor prophets, and I just read over them. Sometimes I'll read them over and over again. I did the Gospels once constantly for 10 years, just continually reading and rereading. And I discovered it's actually all about Jesus. That was probably pretty good that I, that I, read, <laughs> that I read the Gospels. Um, but, but what I do for my recreational reading, which is like, It's like going to a cabin on the weekend. Uh, I I have certain places that I like to go and feed, and Mark 8 is one of those. And there's about eight or 10 verses that I feast on. And the reason, because these verses cut me. They literally pierce my soul every time I read them. It's a two-edged sword. It heals where it cuts. So we need to welcome that cutting of the word of the Lord into our soul because it actually imparts and shapes a perception of reality that you don't get any other way. And uh, I remember Dick Mills, a uh, wonderful friend of ours, that had this message once. If you could imagine uh, a guy standing in front of me, you know, four feet away, and he's got this big sword, and the tip of the sword is at my chest. And then that guy says, come here. And it was a picture of literally walking into the sword of the Lord. And that's what we do when we open up the word. We open it with him and um, not just to learn about him, but to engage with him. Mark chapter eight is this uh, fascinating story about, uh, for me, it's about the renewed mind. In fact, what I plan to do throughout the, throughout the summer is on several occasions talk to you out of the gospel of Mark, because for me, the gospel of Mark illustrates the renewed mind, again, for me, better than any other part of scripture. The renewed mind is essential to our faith. Every single day of our life, the Holy Spirit is working on us for the renewing of the mind. The reason is because it is God's heart to invade this world with his will. Why the renewed mind? It's his heart to invade this world with his will. What does it say about the renewed mind in Romans 12, verse 2? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may what? Prove the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. What is the will of God? Best definition for me is found in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that with me. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Say it again. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what does a renewed mind do then? It proves the will of God. We see the miraculous through faith. We see the miraculous through presence. The most consistent way to see the miraculous is through the renewed mind. There's no cancer in heaven. He said on earth as it is in heaven. And it's through the renewed mind. The renewed mind is not the source of faith. The mind, uh, excuse me, a faith doesn't come from the mind. It comes from the heart. Faith is not the product of striving. It's a result of surrender. That's why it's a heart issue. 
But the renewed mind creates the context for faith, like the banks of a river. The renewed mind creates a context for faith to flow in. So we see Jesus talking to the centurion, and he's stunned by his faith when he gives an explanation on how authority works. It was his understanding that was renewed, came only by revelation, understanding of authority that was the context that gave evidence that he had real faith. So the Lord is, I, I believe, working on us for the renewed mind. Now, a, a couple weeks ago, I likened it unto a truck driver, and I'm going to do it again because it, it fits my illustration best. A truck driver will take off with his load, and after driving a while, that load begins to settle. And so the truck driver often will pull over to a truck stop, and they tighten down the load because things have shifted and settled. How many think maybe in the last 18 months we've had a few things settle and we, we need a little bit of cranking down, tightening of that load? And that's kind of what I feel like we're doing over these next uh, number of weeks uh, here in the summer. Mark chapter 8, let's begin reading with, um, with verse 13. And he left them, getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. Then he said to them, how is it you do not understand? This is the portion that I read over and over again. In fact, quite honestly, there are times I'll open to this chapter and I will just read and ponder verse 17. Jesus, being aware of it, said, why do you reason because you have no bread? Any thought process that begins with what we don't have will have to be repented of. Because you can't build anything substantial on that thought. It makes a poor foundation for human reasoning. That went over pretty good. <laughs> so Jesus gives them instruction and he warns them. He warns them about leaven. The leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees. There is a third leaven in scripture, it's in Matthew 13. It's the leaven of the kingdom. So we know leaven is yeast. You work it into dough. We lived in Weaverville. We only had wood heat and then not even a little space heater for 17 years. And uh, Benny would make uh, homemade bread and she would uh, work that yeast in, work the dough. And sometimes the house was just too cold where the kitchen was. So she'd put it right next to the wood stove and the fire would activate the yeast and it would rise. Fire always activates whatever yeast is in your mind. It always activates, it reveals, it's a revealer. It reveals what's been planted. So Jesus warns of two different kinds of leaven. And leaven represents worldview, ways of thinking. He warns against the Pharisee mindset and the political, or Herod's mindset. Herod's is the political spirit. It doesn't mind you having a belief in God, just don't bring him into the equation, which sounds very familiar in our political climate. It doesn't mind a belief in God, just don't bring him in where that's a determining factor on policy, etc. The religious system has God at the center of everything, but he's impersonal and powerless. He's figurative, not relational. And the kingdom is the opposite of both of those. He's at the center of everything and defines everything by his own person, his own presence. Everything is defined by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every value, everything. In him we live and consist and have our being. So Jesus warns about these value systems that could 
and will persuade you out of the reality of the kingdom of God, which is the greatest reality in existence. Paul told us what you can't see is eternal. What you can see is temporal. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's not here in the physical. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. It's in the unseen. It's a superior reality. But thinking from that place gives you a different approach to a problem in the natural. Thinking from the natural at best makes you a beggar hoping to God to invade your situation. We leave the posture of sons and daughters when we pray only from earth to get him to invade a problem. And yet what he's trying to build in us is an awareness of identity and purpose so that we can effectively use his name, his authority to accomplish his purposes. It's not about our kingdoms. It's not about our, you know, fame or success or any of those things. It's not about my fulfillment of dreams. That's always a byproduct of fulfilling his. If God's not listening to your prayers, maybe talk to him about what he likes to talk about. Just P.S. All right. Both of these realities, the political spirit, the political spirit and the religious spirit, both have one overlapping common denominator. If you study the Gospels, you'll see this repeated over and over again. Both of them are heavily influenced by the fear of man. The Pharisees wouldn't answer a question because the crowd would turn on them. They refused to answer Jesus' question. The political system refused to make this decision because of what this group, Pilate, ended up crucifying Jesus because of the political environment. They're going to tell Caesar. The motivator for many decisions in these two realities is the fear of man. And the crazy thing is they all think it's wisdom. Fear masquerades as wisdom, whether it's fear of a disease, fear of man, doesn't matter what it is. Fear will always attract whatever information is needed to legitimize its existence. Fear reinforces itself. I personally believe, this little side note here, I personally believe that we, this, everybody I'm sure would agree with, we all have strengths but those strengths can be turned into weaknesses. Would you, would you agree with me? The boldness of Peter <laughs> didn't always work so well. All right. But it really worked well once it was under the Lordship of Jesus. Are you with me? All right. The fear of man, I think, starts out as a tender heart that has compassionate care for other people. But the enemy works to manipulate it so that we are actually governed by the gift instead of we govern the gift for kingdom purposes. He turns, he works to turn our place of perception from compassion and concern for the condition of people around us to a place where we become imprisoned by the opinions of people around us. Back to the subject. So Jesus talks to these guys, and let's go to the end of the story first. He says, when I fed the 5,000, we started with five loaves. How many baskets did we have left? They said 12. He said, when we fed the 4,000, we started with how many loaves? Seven. How many baskets were left over? Seven. So you mean to tell me when he fed the most people, he started with the least amount of food and he had the most leftovers? Starting with more is not an advantage. Starting with more, that's Wall Street's perspective. That's not kingdom. You were chosen, not because of your strengths, but because of your weaknesses. You were chosen. (laughs) Why? All of eternity will be spent by us looking into each other's lives in honor in celebration, but giving thanks to God because it was all by grace. We'll see it clearly. It was all by grace. Nobody got here on their own merit. Everybody got here by grace. 
it will be actually the inspiration for praises for all of eternity. Ephesians 2 says it's going to take the ages to come to unravel the mystery of the surpassing greatness of his grace. So here we are. He says, when I broke the 5,000, uh, five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets did you have left? They said 12. Now go back to verse 17. Let's take a look at this. And let me talk to you for a few minutes about it. Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hard? This is interesting because conversion gave us the capacity to see. John 3, verse 3, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The implication is your conversion gives you the capacity to see. Now, in this passage, Jesus says, okay, you can't see. Is your heart still hard? Now, never does he do that in shame. It's never to rub our nose in something. It's never to make us feel hopeless. It's always an invitation to maturity. It's always an invitation to growth. So he's pointing out some weaknesses in their perception. What's the problem here? They just, if you read through this chapter, you notice they just were used in multiplying food a second time for the 4,000. They go from multiplying food to a boat where they don't have enough food and they're afraid of not having food for lunch. Why do you reason that you have no bread? Why did you start your thinking with what you lacked, with what you don't have? All right, let me ask you the question. How many of you have had, honestly, supernatural provision of God? You've had God provide for you, supernatural. How many of you, after that miracle of provision, you had another financial problem? How many of you were as afraid the second time as you were the first time? All right, that's the issue right there, is our experience in the supernatural is supposed to train us how to think and how to see. When he asked the question, why do you reason? He never asked that to them in their beginning stages of discipleship. He never would have expected them to have that awareness, the God of the impossible, unlimited supply is with us. He wouldn't have expected it. But now that they've experienced multiplying food twice, see, miracles are expensive because they require change. Miracles that are just observed and applauded but doesn't shift perspective have not had their full impact. They're supposed to actually change the way I deal with the situations of my life. Once you've seen supernatural supply, you've lost every right to start any thought process with what you don't have. As I heard somebody say recently, Once you've seen supernatural supply, you've lost all rights to begin any thought process with what you don't have. See, miracles are expensive because they require shift. They require change. Any thought process that I start with what I don't have will have to be repented of because anything I build on it is built on sand. It's built on that weak foundation. People around you will applaud you. They'll call it common sense. Common to what world? What kingdom is it common to? Why do you reason that you have no bread? Don't you understand? Can you not perceive? And then he goes on and he asks three questions. He says, having eyes, can't you see? I don't know about you, but often the time, I'm in that situation going, Nope, I cannot see. I know it's me, but it's real. I, don't, I cannot see. And he goes on and says, can't you hear? Having ears, do you not hear? I, I do hear better than I see, but there are times I'm in a situation where I can't see, I can't perceive. It's seeing from the heart, you understand? We're not talking about open visions of angels and all that. That's all wonderful, but that's not the normal everyday seeing of the heart of a believer.
I've had situations. I remember praying for this, uh, this guy who had an a issue with his back. And I couldn't see it with my eyes, but I could see it clearly from my heart. There was a black substance on his back that was clinging to him. I know it sounds weird. I didn't make a big deal of it. I just, the person I was praying with, I said, pull that off his back. And we had worked together long enough. They, they knew just to do what I asked them to do. So they just went as though they could grab this black mass and pull it off his back and he was healed. It's a seeing, it's a perceiving. Here's, here's what I've learned. He says, having eyes, can't you see? Having ears, can't you hear? And do you not remember? The first two, most of us would attribute to somebody connected to their gift. That person really, uh, Chris, for example, has an unusual ability to see. He, see, he, he can see with his natural eyes what, what uh, uh, sometimes what, uh, what I can't even see by faith, you know? He sees it with his natural eyes. It's a gift. So sometimes seeing, we relegate to somebody who has that unusual gift or they're hearing. They just have such an ability to hear from God. I love whenever, I love whenever they share something because they're just, they, I tell they can just are hearing from God. But remembering has never been attributed to a gift. See, I may not have what I think is a qualified gift to see and I may not have in this particular season of my life an ability to hear well, but I can always remember. Psalms 119 verse 111 says this, the testimony of the Lord is your inheritance forever. Say that with me. The testimony of the Lord is your inheritance forever. Let's make it personal. The testimony of the Lord is my inheritance forever. Now what's interesting about that is that verse does not say your testimony is your inheritance forever. It says the testimony of the Lord, which then opens it up to everything God has ever done in all of time in his affair with people, in his activities with people. That then means that when the water came out of the rock for Israel, that's my story. That's my story. It's part of my inheritance. Now, there are sometimes people don't enjoy their inheritance. They don't use their inheritance. They leave it where it is. You know, they, they inherit a home, but they never stay there. And a lot of us have inheritance in God. Some of you never knew they were yours, but these are your stories. When Jesus walked upon that funeral and a dead child was being carried to be buried and the mother was weeping and Jesus, with the father's heart, was so deeply moved with compassion, he raised the child up. That's your story. That's your story. Why? Why is it important? Because prayerfully meditating on the testimony of the Lord equips us with an ability to see. Here's what happens for me. I get in situations where I'm trying to see and I I can't see. There's times I can't. I can't perceive what he's saying, what he's doing. And I'm trying to hear and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to prime the pump, you know, I'm reading the scriptures and doing I'm not hearing at all, but I can remember. And I'll stop, and this is what I'll do. I'll stop and I'll say, all right, two weeks ago, we got a testimony of pancreatic cancer being healed. One of the most horrific kinds of cancer anybody could ever have. And right after that, I saw a woman with ALS healed. Two of the most horrible diseases. This is the season for going after horrible diseases. This is the season. Where did did you get that? We got it from the testimony. It shapes how we think. I remember flying back from New Zealand. I just spent some time, several years back, I just spent some time with Winky Prattney. He's a a wonderful friend and a hero of the faith for me. And he he had had a stroke and it literally blew up like a quarter of his brain. And he, he threw, literally through the renewing of the mind, the Lord had healed his brain. And I had just been with Roland Baker, who had a disease that was eating his brain. They have x-rays. It was, his brain was dying. So here I've got the two smartest men I know, Winky Prattney and Roland Baker, are the two most intelligent guys I think I've ever met. And here they both had brain issues that were going to take their life, and they've been healed. I came back here thinking on the airplane, thinking about, this is interesting. God must be healing minds. He must be healing minds. We've got to target this. 
God's going after trauma of the brain. So in here, out of that, not out of a word of knowledge, not out of, sometimes he'll speak to me something or I'll see a picture of it. Sometimes um, he just puts it in my heart. I, I can tell there's a faith for something. It wasn't this. This was seeing what he's doing. So I called out brain trauma. We had one of our own staff guys that had a horrible, horrible fall and has not been able to do anything with his children, any kind of activity with any kind of movement. He couldn't be in the room when a difficult subject was being discussed. He would just, it would just go into panic mode. He couldn't function. He was in here when I called that out. He went into the men's room and he just, he literally just calmly put his head against the wall as his act of faith. And he was completely healed. A woman sitting right over here, two-year-old child had, had uh, grown up with an abusive husband, an abusive, abusive father. And that child was beat as an infant. A misshaped head, disassociated, wouldn't associate with parents, with people. And some of our students right over there just laid hands on this child. The next morning, the child walked into the, to the mother's room, which never happened, wouldn't associate. Walked into the mother's room and said, Mommy, I'm okay now. See, it's supposed to be that feeding 5,000 and feeding 4,000 become the lenses through which you see an empty boat without food. It's supposed to be the way I see the present challenge. It's supposed to affect perception because it, it causes me to look at things differently. By the way, that child's misshaped head, by, I believe it was by the next morning, was normal, completely normal. How? Different lenses. See, to pray for miracles, to look for God to do what only he can do, and then not be changed ourselves in how we think and how we see challenges, problems, is to miss the point. And so Jesus has got his disciples cornered. They're on a boat, they can't go anywhere. And he says, can't you see? Is your heart still hard? If I've ever lived in a season, I've, we've got two things going on. We've got the residue or whatever you want to call it from the last 18 months. And we have these ongoing testimonies that are being handed to us that are some of the most extraordinary miracles we've ever seen. Some of them are happening. Pancreatic cancer, a student stood in proxy for her mom. Fourth stage. They were gonna run scans on her to see if she could survive three 16-hour surgeries beginning in the month of June. And the scan came back. There's zero cancer left, zero cancer. The mother, excuse me, the daughter just stood in proxy, long distance. It's supposed to be one of the primary lessons of this last season of having to do things on Zoom and, and online and all that stuff. The amount of miracles, as it is right now, we have an ex a great number of people that are becoming born again, literally through the declared word online. The miracles, empty wheelchairs, out of, uh, out of comas. Uh, I have one friend, he's seen two resurrections from the dead, all through online, all through Zoom. Extraordinary miracles taking place. What is it? It's learning to think and to see from God's history with people. See, for many, their history is, is, works against them. Uh, I've been prayed for a thousand times. Nothing's ever happened. Yeah, we prayed for my mom and she passed. What is it? It's not that we pretend those things never happened or that they never existed. It's that we bring them in to the relationship with the Lord so he can heal the place of pain and turn it into a place of strength. Every loss is supposed to be a place of vengeance. 
not your vengeance, not mine, but where God shows himself strong. Uh, somebody wrote a book years ago, Don't Waste Your Sorrows. Don't, don't experience tragedy and then let it just sit there and haunt you. Use it against the enemy. Use it. Why build a life formed around the disappointment of loss when you could use it for the place of promotion for breakthrough? Pancreatic cancer, I just mentioned to you. What did my dad die of? Pancreatic cancer. Two, two days before he died, I talked to Rick Joyner on the phone, and he said, God's going to use this to give you seven times greater anointing against that disease. You have, you, have to, you have to bring this stuff before the Lord. I can't make anything happen. You can't make anything happen, but I can be available. I can, I can find myself leaning in the right direction. I may not be moving fast, but if I'm just moving in the right direction, there's hope. It's, it's you bring this stuff before the Lord and say, let your name be exalted. God, you take, you have the last laugh. You have the last say in this matter. And then suddenly you start attracting these stories. You start attracting this, this news of what God has done and what he's doing. You will always attract whatever you value. Any per I, we, we did this two weeks ago. Any person who values gossip, you put them in the middle of a business with 100 people, they will naturally attract every person in that business that values gossip. But the same is true with testimony. The same is true with words of faith. You will attract what you need. Having eyes, can't you see? Having ears, can't you hear? Can you at least remember? So he takes me through that list. I go, yeah, I'm not seeing well. Oh, my hearing stinks. Sorry. But I can remember. The first two are attributed to gifts. The third is attributed to willingness. What am I willing to feed my soul on? So I pray that in this next season, everybody in this room, every one of us would, would literally be a magnet to hope and to faith and to testimonies, the things that reinforce the why, why we're alive, the purpose for our life, that it would not be void of the supernatural interventions of God. It would not be Occasional, wouldn't be that Russian roulette thing. Well, maybe it's God's will, but one out of 10 times, no, not that. This is the heart, this is the nature of God. It is for the people of God. We come with the, the violence of a John the Baptist who lays hold of that which has been promised. I pray for that, Father. I pray that you put a grace over every family that we'd find ourselves mysteriously running into the very story we needed. And that you'd help us to wear them like lenses and see through your history. Awaken for us in the scripture the very report of the Lord that we need in the season we're in. I'm praying, Father, for every part of our family, online family, local family, that you'd equip us with the eyes to see what's been in front of us all this time. See, if this story is true and it's from Jesus, so obviously it is, this could represent the greatest spiritual reality in my life, but hardness of heart can make me blind to what's right in front of me. And so often we're praying, God, how come, how come you haven't provided? God, how come the miracle hasn't happened yet? How come, how come, how come? When right in front of us is the reality that requires a response, but we're too hard to see what he's put in front of us. So Lord, we turn intentionally away from all those things that would build that crust in our heart to what you're saying and to what you're doing. And help us to be unusually tender to your voice, to your presence for this next season, I pray in Jesus' name.
The Bible says, <clears throat> Jesus made this statement, I was reading it this morning. <clears throat> what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? What does it profit? What would it profit a person to have every dream you've ever had, every thought, every ambition fulfilled, and yet you lost your own soul? In that moment, every person would trade every experience, every blessing, everything they ever had in life for that one sound of him saying, well done, good and faithful servant. There's nothing a person wouldn't give in that moment for that very word. I believe that the Lord brings us together. We have, oh goodness, I think it's eight to 10 people a week are coming to Christ just in our online service. But I want to make sure that everybody in the room knows what it is to be forgiven, to be brought into the family of God, and to be a follower of one. His name is Jesus. And anybody that would be in this room and just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building. I don't want to leave the property until I know I have found peace with God. I've been forgiven of sin. And I truly become a follower of Jesus. If that's anybody in the room, just put a hand up real quick where you are. I'll give just a moment to look around the room. Wave it at me if I miss you, because I want to make sure we give full opportunity for everyone here to make that confession of faith towards Jesus. All right. Online, put in the chat that you want to surrender your life to Jesus. And we have pastors that are there that are ready to talk with you, to pray with you. And we believe this can be the absolute beginning, beginning of a whole new life for you. Bless you. Why don't you go ahead and stand? Tom, come on up and tell them what they've won.